Hello, Super Ultimate Omega Amazing Retro Gaming Tubers! And welcome back to a new series, or at least new game and potentially series of games that I'll be adding to my channel in the future. Um, today's video is more of an introduction to the game and the series, and a bit of a tutorial for how some of this stuff works, uh, because I expect a lot of newer viewers that never played these things as a kid uh, probably don't know so much about what's going on. So um, for a small outline for our video, we're going to talk about the game, we're going to talk about the series and the timeline, a little bit about when it came out and sort of why I'm interested in this sort of stuff. We're going to go over a little bit about how DOSBox works, is how you, which is how you're going to get these kind of games to play on a modern PC. By the way, DOSBox is pretty amazing. We're going to talk about how to get the docs that we use, because simply playing the game without having the manuals is nearly impossible. Um, and I'm going to show you guys a bit about uh, how, how the game works. We'll, we'll load it up in DOSBox in a little bit. And, um, you know, these are the manuals and stuff. We'll, we'll get to all that stuff. So anyway, first off, we're going to start... Sorry, one sec. I'm using a new method of, uh, of switching between... Uh, a new, new method of recording. Okay, right, here we go. So, Pool of Radiance is the first game that we're going to play. This came out ages ago. This is an SSI game. Those of you who are old enough probably remember these quite fondly. They uh, they came out I think primarily on the Commodore 64 although they were ported to a variety of other platforms and they are, if you can see the little image here, um, they're old school, right? Like they're old school but uh, they are very well, they were very well received and uh, I remember them fondly from when I was younger. Not that I'm going to read all about the uh, the actual stuff here. Uh, to give you a bit of an idea uh, about the timeline here, there's a bunch of games in the Pool of Radiance series. Pool of Radiance, Curse of the Azure Bond, Secret of Silver Blades, and then Pools of Darkness. That's all a four-part series, and any characters you make in the first one carry over the next, and then the next, and then the next, should you choose to. The Kryn series works similarly. It goes Champions of Kryn, Death Knights, and then Dark Queen. And there's also the Savage Frontier. Those are the games I'm interested in playing. A lot of the other ones on this list are not the same. These, those, what are we at? Nine games are all quite similar. The Eye of the Beholder series is vastly different. And uh, as we move along, I played lots of Dark Sun and stuff as a kid. And uh, eventually we get into the Infinity Engine era. And those were good times too. But for the point of this video, we're talking about these kind of games. And uh, I played them just for a little bit of a, a story here. When I was young, I had a Commodore 2000. So this is not the 64 that was popular. It was slightly more impressive. I don't know if there's any stats. I didn't pre-Google it or anything, but whatever. It, it came out a little bit later, had a little bit better stats. But this stuff was ancient. The idea of having a word processor and a hard drive, like, I, I remember typing up stuff for school, but <laughs> compared to modern word processors, it's, you can't even, like, like, we actually had to use the insert key and stuff like that because deleting stuff was, a, yeah. I was young, it was a long time ago, it was tough. They were expensive. Um, anyway, point is, to get them running nowadays, you're going to have to use a DOS box, which is emulating DOS, MS-DOS, 3.0 or something, 5.0, I don't know which one it emulates. It doesn't really matter. Point is, it emulates an old version of DOS that will run these games. Because, specifically, they were ported to DOS eventually. Um, I don't think I specifically played Pool of Radiance. I know I played Death Knights of Kryn and Champions of Kryn and a couple of the Silver Blades. I think I played the Silver Blades and maybe Pools. So, you know, I haven't played them all. And when I did play them, I was so young that I'm sure I played them poorly. And, um made lots of mistakes. So it's going to be a, a bit of a learning experience for me. This is I finally got my act together and decided I want to play these old games that I, I played as a very young child and I'm um, looking forward to it and sharing it with you guys. So first off, if you want to follow along or anything, if you're interested, you'll need to get DOSBox websites here. It's real easy. Download, install, no big deal. You'll want to run their config file. Let me switch that over for you guys. This is my DOSBox, DOSBox config file. Um, some of these things, you're, some of these will depend on which game you're trying to play and your own computer settings. So just copying mine will not necessarily work. You're going to have to read through some of these things here and there and then change some of the settings. If you've ever edited a config file, this is very straightforward stuff. 
true, false. It tells you pretty much the options here, the little um, number sign, the pound sign. That means these lines are commented out. You can ignore them other than for information. And then these are the lines that the program actually uses, the stuff that's not commented. So um, sometimes, I think for pool of radiance to make it work, I had to change the audio, uh, the audio device in here somewhere. I can't remember which one exactly I had to fiddle with. There's one that I had to change from Sound Blaster to uh, Tandy uh, in here, probably 44,000. No, I can't. I, point is, it's, it's been a while. Oh, here we go, here. Speaker settings, yeah, I had to turn Tandy on specifically for me to make it work. So like some of the default settings won't work if you want full compatibility. Um, my point is, you're gonna have to mess around a little bit if you wanna play and um, sometimes it takes a bit of fiddling. Also, it's, it's nice at the end to do an auto execute file. All I've done is mount where my DOSBox directory, this is where I actually store the games on my hard drive and typed in mount C is what we're going to type into DOSBox and then that's the location of the folder with all the games in it. Um, you can actually add a lot of stuff in auto execute if you want but uh, that saves me a little bit of time later on. Anyway, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time looking at the config. Like I said, it kind of depends on your own system for how you're going to use it. So we're going to switch over to my DOSBox. Let me switch, move you guys over. So when I load DOSBox up, it automatically sets my, I believe that's for Sound Blaster, which is, I can't remember, I don't know what these numbers, don't ask me. It's just automatically automatic stuff. And then it automatically types that in. If you don't have the auto execute uh, line, you can type that in yourself. Um, once you've done that, it's pretty easy to switch between drives. You start in Z by default, C changes you to your, whatever. well, assuming you mounted it as C, you switch over. Uh, if you type DIR, that shows you what I currently have in that directory. These are all uh, folders with various games and manuals for the uh, the old DOSBox games in them. Um, one thing you may notice right away is the 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 file names are concatenated to eight letters, eight characters max. So it would be Champions of Crin or something, but it concatenates it down to Champy tilde one. So if you want to change directory into that folder, you're going to have to type that specifically, not your long file name. This is old school DOS, eight character maximum. So we're going to change to pool rad, change directory, pool rad. You don't have to worry about uppercase or lowercase. This is not Unix or Linux. And inside here, we'll type directory again. This is an installed game. Just so you want to know, we just, we just scrolled through 137 files. You have no idea what you just missed. Type dir slash p. You can look at them one page at a time and uh, you can see what's in there. It's probably a lot easier nowadays and you guys are probably a lot more familiar with doing this in uh, Windows and just looking at folders and directories. I remember the times when we used to have to do it like this. It was tough. Notice especially setup.exe and start.exe. Also for some, depending on where you get the games and how you download them, you'll need to uh, to run install.exe or something first to, uh, to get it started. Anyway, so if you run setup.exe, for this game, it only has a few options. Uh, we've got video options and audio options. To make it work on my computer, option five was the best selection. Tandy Sound uh, was the only way I could get the audio to work, and EGA Video is a bit more compatible than Tandy for me. Um, some of the later games in the uh, the Pool of Radiant series and the Crin series, I believe, go all the way up to VGA um, graphics. Pretty amazing stuff. So let's just get the game started, make sure it all works. Uh, one thing you'll probably notice pretty quickly is I actually am using an HQ filter, high quality three times, I believe, because uh, the game's in quite a low resolution. It looks very pixelated to me when it gets stretched out. Um, and one of the options on that big config file was uh, if you want to use a, a filter for, for, for pixel filter, basically. Um, if you heard that little audio intro, it should be quite loud. I'm going to be keeping the game audio very low for my recordings because for one, they're not that interesting. It's not very high quality. And there's a lot of quiet space in the game. Like there's no music right now. There's no special sound effects for a lot of the selections. I recommend if you're watching or playing along, probably find some sort of track on YouTube or on your uh, MP3 player or whatever that fits the mood for you and play along if you want to have a more musical experience. Maybe just turn the in-game sound off entirely should you really choose to. So anyway, let's go through a little bit about um, DOSBox, or sorry, not DOSBox, the, the game creation. I'm just going to take a short break here and I'll be right back.
Okay, I am back. Sorry for the small cut. I wanted to make a party so I could save some time during this uh, tutorial phase. <laughs> so first off, we're going to go over a little bit about party creation and uh, sort of what some of the stats mean in case you're unfamiliar. So we'll start with create a new character and you can see the races we can select from. Now for reasons I'll get into a little bit later on, uh, for this game specifically it's very human centered. Um, it's very difficult in this series of games to bring uh, along other other races uh, successfully. This is D&D first edition rules, which I'm not even all that familiar with other than playing these games. So uh, unless you're super familiar, um, it's going to be a bit of a learning curve. Uh, so we'll start with, say, a human just to, to get started here. And there is actually a difference between male and female in um, these games. Unfortunately, I do not really approve, but... Uh, Females cannot be as strong of fighters as males, specifically. So, if you want to be a fighter, also notice that we're using sort of the old school versions. They're not wizards, they're not sorcerers, they are magic users. In fact, in this game, I don't even believe we've gotten to white, white robes and red robes yet. This is just plain old magic. And uh, you can choose your um, uh, alignment here. I assume by now most people understand how these work. On the left side, you've got from lawful to neutral to chaotic. On the right side, you've got from good to neutral to evil. Lawful is following the laws, tends to be the thing. Neutral on the left side tends to mean doesn't really care about the laws, but doesn't break them unnecessarily. Chaotic sort of does what they want kind of thing. Good is more, you know, nice to people, doesn't, doesn't just cause undue suffering. Neutral, again, maybe tries to balance it. And whereas evil would be... Um, you know, causing pain for your own self-pleasure. There's, there's, there's lots of cool ways of explaining this. I find a lot of the best, most interesting characters tend to have like a, a weird mix, like lawful evil or chaotic good. Um, but you know, the, the typical evil people are chaotic mages or chaotic evil, and the typical good guys are lawful good. And maybe the, um, the, the sage in the woods or, or something, the hermit is true neutral maybe, or something like that. Maybe that's the, the Buddhist monk, perhaps. I don't know. Anyway, I don't believe it's going to make a huge difference. So, um, first off, this is our character screen. Uh, most of this stuff should look pretty normal. You've got um, gender, race, age. You can't change these, but sometimes there's spells and stuff that actually do age you. I, I don't know for sure if it's going to make any difference on the gameplay, but the number can go up. Um, your alignment, your class, and sort of your, your base attributes. So... On this screen, if I press no, N for O, N for no, uh, it will re-roll everything. So these are all, in typical old school fashion, a 3d6. So you can get a number between 3 and 18 on any of these rolls. If you're a fighter, there's an additional number besides strength that I'll show you in a minute. And uh, depending on your race, sometimes there's a, a, a max or min sort of difference. Like dwarves get plus 1 to constitution, minus 1 to dexterity, I believe. Elves, I think, get plus 1 to dexterity. I can't remember all of them in this old version, but uh, there's a couple little things like that. It also rolls your HP, so I think 2 is like a pretty bad roll. Um, mages don't start with great HP, but uh, you know, you can see how it works. The truth is, it doesn't actually matter much, because after we keep this character and name them, uh, we'll call him just, you know, example mage. Um, well, first off, I guess we can customize him a little bit. So, if you look at his little picture on the top right, we can change his face. Some of the faces are pretty ridiculous, um, but these are the ones we've got, basically. Um, old school pixel art, you know how it goes. And yeah, that guy, he's the troll face for sure. And then you can change the body to match, try to match his uh, his class, I would assume, So the, for the most part. Um, you know, you can you can have a guy with a girl's body. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> Some of those are pretty bad. So anyway, I, I figured I would just show those off quick. And you can change, this will be his uh, in battle icon. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of what these can look like. You can change his head uh, a little bit. There's maybe half a dozen or a dozen different uh, head pixel art and um, you know whatever. That's kind of like a girl with long hair maybe. Um, so we'll keep that of course. And you can change what weapon. This is not what weapon he has equipped. This is just what weapon it looks like he has equipped. You could easily have a sword equipped and uh, a flail here, and it wouldn't make any difference at all. We can also change these in-game later on to suit our needs. This is another thing that in the later games in the series uh, is improved upon significantly. 
um, this first game, Pool of Radiance, has got like the least amount of options and probably the weakest interface. It gets step-by-step uh, step a little bit better as time goes on. Uh, exit there. And then the second action is we've got some color choices. So we can change his color of his weapon a little bit. Um, keep that. We can change the color of his body a little bit. Woohoo. I'm probably not going to really mess with this a whole lot. His hair color or her hair color. Uh, if he had a shield equipped, you could change that. If he has arms, which hopefully he does, you can change his bottom. You know, it, 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 it gives you some customization options should you choose to want to mess around. This is not the kind of stuff I tend to enjoy very much, especially not in these old games. But even in the new ones, the, the Skyrims and stuff, I don't really spend a lot of time customizing my looks. It's just not something I enjoy. And then the last section of color is... Like, the, 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 there's basically two main colors to every part. And you can change them both. So that's why there's color one and color two. Size uh, is specifically just changes between small and large. Uh, although it might mess up your head icon, for instance. Um, small would, I assume, if you want to keep things sensible, be for like dwarves and halflings. And then large is for basically everybody else, probably. Unless you want to play as a role play as a, a child human or something silly. Uh, so anyway, we'll exit like that. I don't like that icon. Oh, I, I pressed keep by accident. Oh, well. Exit. Uh, I guess it's good enough. Okay, so we've got a character. We can add him here. So, normally you'd want to make six characters for your party and then add them in. And this is, the screen now sort of fluffs up a little bit and now you can actually do some more stuff. You can still view him. And now when you trade, you can move around, um, I think it's just money for now from this page. Dropping just lets you drop his coins. He's got 40 gold coins. Um, but you can modify, and this is where it gets kind of fun for me. You can just select whatever stat you want. So we'll probably be playing with a full 18 max stat kind of character. These old games are fairly difficult, and... Um, Playing them with lower stats doesn't help you out a whole lot. Like, I mean, for a magic user, you'd probably want to roll until you got 18 intelligence. Um, and probably dexterity, so you have some armor class. And maybe constitution, so you have some HP. Um, but you might not care about charisma, so that's your dump stat. And wisdom would be a dump stat. And strength, you might try to get a little bit, but it's not a big deal. They can't really use a lot of good weapons anyway when you're a pure magic user. Um... So you would end up just re-rolling until you got someone that fit the uh, the picture you wanted. So I'm just going to go with pure good stats because I feel like it's going to help out a little bit. Um, the game does, this game specifically, not the other ones so much, but this game actually does punish you a little bit for picking max stats. Um, the size of random enemy encounters is determined by your overall stats of your characters. So if you put everybody at three, you'll fight random encounters with like just one or two enemies per group. If you put everyone at 18, you'll fight groups of, I don't know, 10 or 15. And if you somehow get them up by, by save file editing up to like in the mid-20s, you'll fight groups of like 25 enemies at a time. So suffice to say, you do get punished a little bit um, for, uh, for maxing out your stats. But it's not a big deal in the long run. Also, I should make sure I put my HP at max. Um, I'm not going to go over what all the stats do exactly. Hopefully you guys can see um, AC and Thaco changing as strength goes up. Intelligence will give us more spells on a magic user. Wisdom will give us more spells on a cleric. Dexterity affects your armor class. Constitution affects your maximum HP. Uh, I think each class has like a, a die roll per level up. So I think fighters are like a D10. Mages are probably a D4. And then Constitution gives you a plus certain number of HP per level up depending on your, your bonus. And I don't know if Charisma is going to do a whole lot in this game to be honest. So anyway, that's uh, like a pimped out magic user. I suppose this is a good point to go over what AC and Thaco means, because if you're not used to playing first and second and maybe third generation D&D, &D, certainly not the new stuff anyway, um, you won't even recognize those as, as, as numbers you're used to. Armor class is based on your dexterity, some magical armor, and your main armor and stuff. Lower is better. The, harder, the lower it is, the harder it is for you to be hit. We can get down to the negatives, the negative tens. The the base for a human, for base for a normal sized character, I believe, is ten. So we're currently getting minus four from dexterity. And if you go too low, it adds up instead. So that would be really bad. Um, 
whereas having a base AC of 6 is a little bit better. And then if you put on, you know, plate mail and a shield and a ring of protection, it'll just keep dropping down and down and down. Pretty standard. So AC shouldn't be too hard. Thaco is probably the number that people get messed up with. It stands for 2 hit armor class 0. So if you're attacking an enemy that has an armor class of 0, this is the number you have to roll on a d20, a 20-sided dice, to hit. A 20 will always hit, a 1 will always miss, but this number or higher will hit. So for a mage, we get really low thaco, or really, well, it's a high thaco, which is bad. You want a low thaco. Um, so if he was trying to hit himself, for instance, if he was fighting another mage exactly the same, a duplicate, because his armor class is not 0, because he has an armor class of 6, you would go 19 minus 6 is 3, he would have to roll a 13 or higher to hit. Um, if someone had an armor class of 10, he would have to roll a 9 or higher. If someone has an armor class of 0, he has to roll a 19. If someone has an armor class of minus 1, he has to roll a 20 every time. And if they have lower, it just requires you to hit 20 no matter what. You can't, there's never impossible to hit, it's just you have to roll a 20 for a crit, basically. Um, which I don't even know if they count as crits. They might just be you hit, guaranteed. I don't. I can't remember all the mechanics. Hopefully that explains the basics for AC and Thaco. Um, encumbrance is based on how much you carry. There's sort of a maximum based on your strength uh, before you're encumbered and can't move or something. It might, it might lower your movement points. I know um, the heavier the armor you wear, the lower your movement points, and later on there'll be magic equipment to change that kind of stuff. Anyway, I don't want to ramble on too long about the stats. Hopefully that gives you guys the idea of how this works in um, sort of old school D&D first edition rules. Um, other than just creating your party here, there's not a lot else that we really want to worry about. Uh, unfortunately, because I've now created a party, I can't load my game. So we're going to exit, not save. Well, put it in J, I guess. I don't want to overwrite A, basically. So let's start up the game. And we'll load a pre-built party that I made just quick. And uh, I'll show you a little bit of the in-game interface before we finish up the tutorial. Just so you guys get a bit better idea what's going on. So we loaded save game A. I made a bunch of test characters. And this is our main view for uh, the world map. Well, town, uh, dungeon map, I guess you might call it. There is possibly a world map later on. Um, first off, A for area will show you a top-down view. You can move around in this view if you like. Uh, although I find it a little bit difficult to uh, recognize what's around. I like this view better because I think the context gives you a bit better idea where you're going and where the doors are and stuff. Um, so I'll mostly be moving around in this view. Also, I forgot to mention, um, in DOSBox you can change the number of cycles per second. I'm currently running at about 6,000 to make the game run relatively quick. It might be quicker than it used to by default, um, which I think is fine, um, just to save a little bit of time. Um, but, you know, it, that depends on your computer as well. You may need to run at a higher or lower number of cycles for the game to run properly. So, we've got our six characters. Uh, let's have a quick look at some of them just to show you kind of how some of the stats work. I also bought them a weapon and armor for some people, so you can see like a, a, normal, num a normal amount of stats. Um, the number in parentheses after the strength 18, that is a second roll on a D100. So that number goes from 1... To 100 which is what we're at right now um, and the higher that number the better in fact it makes a huge difference to your Thaco and damage uh, bonus um, so human male in this version is the only one that can get all the way to zero zero a human female stops at 50 a dwarf male stops at 99 uh, I don't remember them all but some of them stop at like 75 or 70 or 50 and this is all assuming you have a fighter as part of your class I also forgot something about classes I'm going to show you in a second. Um, so anyway, this, this is like a well-built fighter. I gave them, or I bought them a long sword, a shield, and some banded mail. And I readied them so that they're equipped. And um, that affects our stats here. So we managed to get AC minus 1. We managed to do 1d8 plus 6 for damage and a Thaco of 17. Um, you know, not too bad. They can move nine move my, nine spots. I believe there's a minus three penalty to movement from banded mail, but we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff too much. That's our fighter. So other class options are multi-classes, and I, I didn't really mention this earlier. Maybe I should have. Um, the first thing on the dwarf page, I think I forgot to max out charisma. It should be 18, but uh, m maybe dwarves only go up to 16. I can't even remember 100%, but the main thing is they get minus one max dexterity, plus one max constitution. So they do get good 
uh, HP and a little bit lower armor class than uh, humans. And of course they have a max of 99 strength, uh, 18 slash 99, however you want to look at it. Now this is a fighter slash thief. Um, how do I want to do this? Maybe if I go to encamp mode it'll be a little bit easier to look at what I want to look at. Well, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't matter right now, but um, the experience for multi-classes is split between your classes. So if you have a single class character and you get 100 experience, you'll get 100 experience towards fighter. If you're a fighter slash thief or any two, you'll get 50 to each. So the experience here would say 50. So multi-class characters level up slower, but in multiple classes. So you can get thieves who on their own can't equip heavy armor and certain weapons, except because it's a fighter thief, he'll be able to equip all weapons and armor thanks to his fighter, plus he'll be able to backstab thanks to thief and also detect traps and stuff to some degree. Um, Multi-class has its pros and cons, namely on it levels up slower and more spread out, um, but um, you can definitely mix stuff up together. So we'll have a quick look at the, the rest of the team here. This is a half-elf cleric fighter magic user. These were my favorite when I was a kid. They're not the greatest thing since sliced bread in the long run, although they can use both, both priest magic or cleric magic and offensive uh, magic user magic, like wizard magic, cleric magic, whatever as well as wear armor. The thing is they level up very slowly and I haven't gotten to it yet, but in this series of games, um, depending on your race, you have a, a level limit. So I believe for the half elf, they'll have a maximum fighter level of six or something. So if you're just playing Pool of Radiance, it's not a big deal. But if you want to carry these characters forward to the rest of the games, um, this will, will never get past level six. So you'll be you know, level 6, 6, 10 at some point or something like that. Um, I don't know what the max levels are off the top of my head, but the thing is humans are basically the only character, or the only race that can get max of any level. Uh, the multi-class races, like humans can't be multi-class, you have to be like an elf or a half elf. There's some, I, I should have shown it at the beginning, I, that was my bad. Um, e I'll, I'll show it at the end of the video. Each, um, each race has their own sort of uh, class limitations as well as max level and... Uh, cut off classes that they just can't be. So anyway, um, that's sort of, that's my spiel on that. Um, so if you make a pure, a pure mage, for instance, um, this is a, a pure elf mage, which is probably worse than a pure human mage because they've probably got a level limit on magic user. But these guys aren't able to equip like any armor at all. Um, and they can use very limited weapons like darts and, and uh, st staves and stuff. Uh, I just want to show you this in the in the screen. You can join stuff like that together as well as have it. Kind of convenient for that kind of stuff. Um, I'll talk about a little bit more about party building later on. Let's finish going over the, the user interface. If you turn search on and you move, it takes 10 minutes per step. And you're a little bit more likely to... Well, you're more likely to find stuff on the ground. Uh, if you press look, it just gives you a description of where you are. If you do move normally, it's one minute per square. Search just take, makes it take longer. Um, casting, if you have a spell ready to go, you can cast it. Now, some spells are battle spells, so sleep is not going to do anything right now. And um, let's go to encamp to finish up, basically. So, magic. Yeah, we'll, we'll spend a minute on magic for these old games. You have to memorize your spells ahead of time in D&D &D World. I have not memorized any spells with the Cleric Fighter Mage yet, and you can see at the bottom we can learn, we can memorize up to three Cleric spells, but only one Magic, one Mage spell at level one. So we just select them. Uh, let's, let's learn, you know, Bless, Curse, and Cure Light Runes for now. And then one Magic Mage spell, let's learn um, Sleep is pretty good, honestly. And then that spells to be memorized, and then you have to rest for the game calculates how long it takes to actually memorize those spells so you can cast them in battle. Um, you have to be sure you're in the correct area for that though. If you try to rest right now, the guards would come and tell us to get out of the way. Or if you're resting somewhere dangerous, you'll get attacked by enemies. Um, I have already memorized some spells for a couple other people. Scribe is if you've got a scroll and you have a magic user and you want to permanently write that spell into your, um, like, into your book so you permanently learn it. Display will show us any spell effects on our current uh, party. So if I had cast Bless, it would show it here. And that's about it. No, Alter. 
you can move your with order you can move people around usually you want to keep people with the most amount of hp probably at the front um our ac and armor class the people at the back you want to keep your mages they start a little bit further away from the enemies in battle drop would permanently remove them from the party speed is how quickly the text displays icon lets you adjust your um your battle icons if you say you want to keep your weapons up to date so you buy a new sword you want to make sure it's here you can do that and exit picks yeah uh, i believe this was in the older games maybe if your computer wasn't very quickly if you turn monster picks and portrait picks off it might save you a little bit of processing time this is how old we're talking about um i'm not going to worry about that I, i'm pretty sure we can handle it on the emulator so let's just go get into a quick battle just to show you guys what these look like because um Oh, for one thing too, when I'm actually doing the Let's Play, I'll have to be doing some narration of the text. So I'll be reading those out loud with uh, some level of voice. Because I think, uh, like I said, the game's a little dry on the music. So let's, uh, to get an automatic fight here, I'm pretty sure if we just rest for, uh, you know, an hour or two, it will probably start a fight. Yeah, it didn't take very long. We found some orcs. Let's advance towards them. We surprise them amazingly, and then uh, let's, instead of parlay, let's just combat. Alright, we got a little bit of music. So, first off, this is our battle screen. Uh, we're going to use aim and manual to look around. So you can see there's quite a lot of orcs. Now, they're not very tough. AC6 with 5 HP, they're weaker than us by a small margin. If we have random stats, they might be pretty equivalent, to be honest. But because we have like pretty pimped out stats, we'll be slightly better than them. Uh, and you can move around the uh, the map if you want. Um, I believe the map does um, match up to to your your area map on the dungeon. So I believe if you can sort out your orientation that like this is maybe this was the door we came in into this area. Or something I don't know I'm not gonna worry about it but I think it does line up to it a little bit it's just it's not perfect anyway um let's see so so aim you can just manually switch between all the different and it, basically everything that person can see and you'll cycle between them previous goes the other way manual lets you move it around yourself center centers the uh, the view on you this is very important for spells like fireball so that you know exactly who it's gonna hit once you learn the radius of them um, so anyway, this is our mage. Uh, let's cast sleep because we've got this ready to go. Some spells have longer casting time, so you're not going to be able to just, uh, get away with, um, instant cast like that, for instance. So let's target that guy. Oh, sorry, it's an AoE spell. I, I, I totally forgot. So we'll probably lose some people thanks to that. that. That was a good mistake. I have some things to learn. Anyway, anyone who fell asleep is now helpless, which means they'll die in one hit. Um, which is good for the orcs and very bad for our cleric and our fighter here. <laughs> so I should have targeted right here and hopefully that would have knocked out all of those orcs in one shot. Like I said, I've got some things to learn. I don't remember if I actually memorized any spells. No, there's no cast. Turn is for undead and will make them basically run away. And you don't get any experience, but you do get... Uh, well, you get rid of them. So anyway, let's move over and kill this guy. Let's move the fighter mage. In fact, now that I think about it, because those orcs are helpless, we can probably keep our two people safe as long as we kind of ignore... Oh, do we have the wrong weapon? I think I messed up. Well, I'm going to get to show you something else interesting. Um, you can undo your movement if you press escape. Uh, right, I gave my fighter mage a longbow, so we'll, uh, we'll use that here, but... I want to show you what happens if you try to run away, move out of uh, zone of control. Um, let's target just random orc for now. Missed. Let's have our fighter thief take a swing. Well, first, no, we'll, we'll just take a swing, I guess. He missed again. All right, you got another turn. Aim, manual, try to kill this guy if we can. Did three damage. Uh, our mage is now out of spells, but he's got some darts. So we'll toss a dart at this guy. Oh, it's out of range, maybe. Yeah, he can only... Darts can only go range of five, I suppose. That's that's acceptable. Let's move our cleric fighter to try to block up this a little bit. I'm kind of worried if my people stay asleep, they're just going to get one shot here. That cruel blow 
is pretty bad. All right, well, our we might lose this battle. No, there we go. We got a good hit. Because I messed up my sleep right off the bat. Aim, manual. I'll, I'll get a lot faster at this once I uh, get a hang for the controls, basically. Oh, we got two shots today. Good. Let's uh, take another shot on, uh, let's see, that guy. Now, the reason I didn't slay the helpless orcs right away was so that um, nobody that was not helpless could move in and slay my dudes. So, move a little bit closer. That guy was on guard, so he got a free attack when we moved closer. That's all that was. That will do. Aim. Manual. Yeah, I, uh, I still have two helpless people. If I kill this guy, I'm worried that this guy will move in and then wipe that guy out, basically, so... We'll figure out how the AI works. Also, my uh, fighter thief up here is taking a lot of damage already, so he might be in trouble. Oh, they all surrendered. Okay, good. We're, we're totally fine. Uh, manual. And then this guy will die. Even ranged attacks. Cruel blow kills them. Alright, we are done. Exit. Done. I mean, I didn't show you every single thing. You can guard. If somebody moves close, you get a free attack. If you delay, you save your turn for later on in the round so you can go last. Um, speed is just changing the, the, the tech speed. Quit. End your turn instantly. Um, or, sorry, no, quick... Um, that's not what quick does. Quick auto chooses. If you're next to an enemy, it will just attack. If you're on your own, you just guard. It's kind of like auto battle. Anyway, at the end of the battle, we... Oops, I totally did the wrong one there. Uh, quick, quick. Continue battle, no. So, at the end of the battle, you get a little bit of experience points. You get a little bit of loot. Let's have a look. We get 240 silver. It's not a whole lot. Now, the pool and share buttons. Pool takes everyone's money, throws it in a pile. I just pressed it. So, now there's all this money here. And if you hit share, it just divvies it out between everyone evenly. Pretty simple. And then we exit. So that was your first battle. Hopefully that gives you an idea of how the battle mechanics of this game work. Um, at the at, for the for this video, feel free to leave comments. It's going to be a pretty long video, but uh, if you don't understand something, feel free to to let me know, and I will try to explain it. So that's all for the the, the battle section. I want to show you guys some of the uh, the manuals and stuff. Because I think these are really interesting, and when I do my Let's Play, I want to um, I want to reference these as we go along. I guess first off, maybe before we get too far into it here, um, come on, load up for me. Sorry for the blank screen for a second. Sometimes switching to my browser is a little bit fiddly. There we go. Um, if you want to get the document yourself, I recommend going to replacementdocs.com. And uh, it's really good, you just have to know the name of the game, uh, for downloading manuals, hint books, um, you know, it, ha it has a lot of games in it. Anyway, this, this is where I got the majority of the, the docs for the game. If you want to find the game itself, I haven't really mentioned it because I'm not 100% sure how legal it is. Point is, if you Google the name of the game and look around a little bit, somewhere like around here maybe, or maybe this one, uh, you might be able to figure it out on your own. I'm not you know, giving you a direct guide, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's okay at this point in time. Uh, I haven't been able to find this on, like, GLG or anything, for instance. So anyway, let's uh, let's look at some of these docs briefly, just to go over sort of uh, what I want to show you guys. First off, we'll look at the manual. Uh, that's not the manual. That's not the manual. This is the manual, okay. So, the manual would not be the most important. This is, like, a lot of the stuff I just explained is in this one. Um... It will talk about basic mechanics for the game, all this stuff. I'm not too worried about covering all this. The really important thing in the manual, I believe, is right at the end here somewhere. It does talk a little bit about what the spells do and all that and whatever. It's no big deal. Um, yeah, okay. This is, this is the screen I wanted to show you guys because this is what's important. Down here for the max level by class. Essentially... If you're only playing Pool of Radius, Radiance, like I said, it doesn't make too much of a difference. You're probably not going to get much higher levels um, than these numbers anyway. In fact, you know, getting 11th level magic user may be very difficult um, in the first game. But if you want to carry this over to eventually Pools of Darkness, the fourth game, you're much, you're very likely to have like level 20, 25 um, characters. 
And even on a multi-class, uh, say a cleric, fighter, mage, say you had a half-elf, this is just not good enough. Level 5 slash 8 slash 8 compared to a human who was a, a mage that was like level 20 or something is just not really going to compete. You can't, you can't keep that up. So from what I understand, especially this series, is really based on using humans. Now humans have a dual class mechanic where you level up to a certain point, then you sort of forget that class, switch to something else, level that up. Once you've surpassed the level with the new class, then you sort of regain all your abilities from the old one and uh, continue on. It's, we may look at that later on. I'm not, it's not my favorite mechanic, to be honest, but uh, it has a use. So my point is we're going to be picking a party of mostly humans because that's kind of how this game is designed. Um, and this does give you a good idea, like dwarves, elves, and gnomes can't be clerics, neither can halflings. Um, Dwarves, gnomes, and halflings cannot be magic users in this game. So, you know, whatever. It gives you a pretty good idea, I think. Um, this gives you a, a better idea of the stat maxes uh, and minimums, I suppose. But yeah, I mean, I talked about how humans, um, how females had a lower strength max. There you go. Um, like for a halfling, a girl is much weaker than a boy for a lot of the classes, to be honest. And uh, they didn't keep that for a lot of the later D&Ds, so it's not in. Um, but anyway, this is kind of a useful little reference. Um, it does tell you a little bit about some of the spells and uh, a little bit of the game mechanics. Anyway, next up, probably a little bit more useful will be the Adventurer's Journal. Here we go. This thing has got lots of lore. It's a little bit zoomed in here. Let's zoom out a little bit. Uh, it's got lots of lore and maps and stuff. This is our first town, for instance. Um, and if you want to read along kind of uh, about about the land of Flan. Uh, you can learn the history of Flan and the Moon Sea Reaches. I'm not going to read it all, but I recommend if you're interested, you check out this kind of uh, document and have a read yourself. Um, lots of good book-style lore for old D&D uh, &D games, basically. Uh, it also gives us an idea of some enemies uh, with uh, their level. So we fought some goblins, I believe. If we scroll to them in here... Hobgoblins, yeah. They're level 1, that's why we did pretty well. If we were to run into Hobgoblins at level 2, they may have been more difficult. Well, they would have been more difficult. Um, these are... A lot of times in game, we'll have... Uh, it'll refer to a certain line of text um, in the in the manual. So if it says, you know, double... It, read me journal entry number 7. We'll have to switch to one of these and I'll read it to you guys. And uh, I'm specifically wanting to show these off because I think some of the artwork is really nice, and I think you miss out on it in-game if you don't show it off here. So, uh, you know, that's all stuff from the game. There's maps and stuff we'll find eventually, and um, there's some tavern tales here at the end for just sort of gossip, and uh, that's the main thing. Also, a little bit about how money works. Um, it does show you all the spells in this game. As we continue on, if we make it to the second, third, and fourth games, I'm pretty sure fourth and fifth and maybe even sixth level magic user spells get unlocked as we go further. This was just the first one. There's a fairly low level limit. We're not going to be getting to level 12, I don't think, for instance. And uh, a little bit of basic stats, how much experience it takes to get levels up, etc. You, know you know the deal, right? Um, I do want to show briefly the weapon chart. Um, this is all pretty standard. Clerics can only use um, non-bladed weapons, uh, but they can use any armor and shield. And if you have a fighter cleric, the any here overwrites the cleric. So a fighter cleric can equip anything. A fighter mage can equip anything. Normally a mage cannot equip armor or shields and very few weapons. So the, the fighter overrules everything else. A cleric mage would overrule the mage rules as well. A cleric mage would work out fairly well for stats. Um, also of, of note, there are a ton of different weapons in this game, more than we'll ever really use. Um, and it's kind of neat to know that some weapons are slightly better at large enemies than weak enemies. So like typically, like the standard might be a long sword. It's slightly better against large enemies, but maybe it'd be worth looking at a morning star if you're not fighting large enemies because it's also one handed uh, and it does slightly better against, um, well, a slightly higher minimum roll. For, for normal sized enemies. On the other hand, it's not as good against large. So, you know, I think a lot of this is going to depend on what weapons we find. Um, you know, a two-handed sword looks pretty awesome against large enemies. It just depends on if we find a magic one, because that's what we're going to be looking for. 
it has all the ranged weapons. There's not a lot of difference from what I can see. Most bows do 1 to 6 damage. Um, that's just what we got. And the crossbows might be just slightly better. I don't know. They probably weigh more or something. Anyway, that covers the manual. The last document I want to show you guys is the clue book. And I should have started right at the top, but... Uh, the clue book um, is what we're gonna, what I'm going to be following to save a lot of time in the middle of the game. And if you're playing along, I kind of recommend you you maybe have a look at this. These games can be really frustrating because you're probably supposed to draw these maps yourself. And unless you feel like doing that, um, you're probably gonna have a hard time. It's really easy to get lost and stuck in these games if you're not following some sort of guide. And these are really good guides, actually. Some of the nicer, older guides. This is our first uh, town, for instance, and it shows you kind of where all the, the, the shops are, places of note, sort of things you'll need to do for your quest. Um, the next dungeon, this was the slums. We just barely walked into this. This shows us sort of, you know, important places to go to, to get quests and stuff. I'll be, you know, following along with this fairly well, I think. Um, not, you know, step by step exactly, but uh, I'll show them off every now and then when I get to a new area, for instance. Because I think the maps look quite nice, actually. Whoever drew this must have spent a lot of time, so I think it's worth showing off in the middle of a Let's Play. So, uh, clue book, pretty awesome. You definitely need the Adventurer's Journal, and then the manual is moderately useful. So, I believe that's about it for my uh, intro slash tutorial. Um... The last thing I want to talk about is, not that this is going to start any time in the next couple days, it's going to take me a, uh, a, a couple weeks before I'm ready to start, but uh, I am looking for character suggestions or character names to join in. Um, so I'll be needing six people's names, and I'm uh, the reason I'm mentioning at the end of the video, of course, is that I'm looking for people who are interested in the game and not just... Leaving, a, leaving their name and never watching anything. I think it's it's a little bit better when we get a little bit of play between me and the viewers. I like that kind of stuff. It's fun. So, I've got room for six. Unfortunately, I have to pick a party that I think can be successful in the long term. So, I can't let you guys select your race and class. I have to find the right number of magic users and clerics and fighters to suit my needs. And part of that means I can't necessarily use... A lot of half elves and just split the split the uh, the the, uh, the the classes up to the same team. If we do the Crin series later on, the rules are a little bit different, a little bit better, and we can get away with multi-classing a lot easier. We'll probably pick mostly humans, mostly males, so we don't have to worry about the fighter strength weakness, and uh, we'll pick between the four classes as we need. We'll probably have, you know, a couple fighters, a couple magic users. I might do like a fighter, a fighter, and a, a fighter. I don't know how I'd want to set this up. I might do like two fighters, two clerics, a magic user, and a thief, or something like that. Something along those lines. And uh, we'll, we'll set it with that. You can... So so first off, you can determine your alignment. I don't really care if you have a preference. I, it doesn't really matter to me much. Um, I'll be picking the stats out. But you can pick your name. And I tested this out before. So if you're writing it down, you have 15 characters worth of letters. Um, so you got a pretty long name can fit in there, and uh, we can throw that in. So I'll, I'll allow people to throw that. And you can change your portrait here. Um, if there's a specific head you prefer, um, you know, feel free to let me know. Like I said, I actually don't even mind so much giving a female body to a technically male person, because I have to use male fighter for the stats, but if you want to have a female body, I don't really care too much. Or if you're not a fighter, in fact, being a female doesn't matter at all, for instance. Uh, but those are all the heads. Just let me know, like, yellow girl, white old man, whatever. I'm sure we can work it out. There's not that many. Um, dude with helmet, black hair, blue tinge, brown hair girl, you know, whatever. If you want one, if you don't care, I'll pick something out. And then the body, I assume we should keep these to classes, so it makes a little bit of sense. Like. This should be for a mage, that's probably a fighter body, probably a cleric or a knight. This is kind of ranger-ish, uh, definitely a thief, kind of a fighter, probably a thief, I guess a thief, definitely a thief, girl thief, girl fighter, girl mage, you know, whatever, they're not that great, so it doesn't really make the biggest difference. And then I'll probably pick out, to some degree, a uh, an in-game icon that I can recognize, because I need the battle icons to be descriptive enough that I can instantly recognize that's my fighter, that's my mage, blah blah blah, let's go. So, don't worry about it too much. 
mostly I'm just looking for names. So if you have a suggestion for a name, leave it in the comments. Uh, if you've got questions about either DOSBox, I can try to help a little bit, or getting these old games to run, and just information about these things. I figure I wanted to have this video out fairly early before I start the series because uh, I may have missed something really important that doesn't make any sense for people. Um, these kind of games, you know, it, it takes a bit of, it, there's a bit of a learning curve to get used to them, right? So, <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching my intro slash tutorial. I hope you've enjoyed, maybe learned a thing or two, and I hope once we get around to uh, the series, you join me for a, a, a super ultimate ultra retro gaming experience. See you later, guys. But wait, there's more! Sorry for the extended video, it's been a little while since I recorded the first tutorial session, but uh, I want to show this off before we, uh, we, we finish this video. There's one more thing that I've learned, and I think it's uh, going to really make a big difference to the series and the game. This current interface, if you look to the left and the, right and the top of the screen, is uh, some stuff I've been able to add in with a program called Goldbox Companion. I'll, I'll, I'll show it off first. Uh, switch over to my browser. This is where you can get it. Um, I'll leave a link in the description. And it will work with all of the games that I'm talking about using. Uh, and what it does is it's kind of, it's got like a, a character editor and stuff. Like, you could certainly use it to cheat, should you uh, want to do that. Um, I'll talk about sort of what I'm going to use it for in a minute here. So, anyway, this is uh, the program. It's pretty good. So, let me switch back to the game. And also uh, the rest of the, uh, the, the new interface. So, basically, what it's done, the first and foremost, at the top, this will show our party. It will show just under their name. It will show their experience, to, uh, their progress to the next level, as well as their HP. Now, on this mode, you can see their HP. You can't see their max. So when they take damage, it'll just say five, for instance. If you take two damage, um, this will show you five out of seven, for instance, and it also have a little bar as they take damage. Um, the, the main, the idea here is on this screen. It's not the biggest deal in the world, but where it's really going to help is in battle. Because in battle, you don't have this information. You have to manually select each person. This will show us our party's HP and experience all the time. It's going to be super, super useful. Also super, super useful to the left is a map. And it actually will update, assuming there's a little bit of tweaking I have to do to get it to work. So there'll be a couple things. But it's a map that will show our current location as well as uh, the numbers. And if you look to the left, I can't mouse over, but if assuming this shows up for you guys, It'll show you a quick idea of all the different uh, locations on the map. If I mouse over, like I said, it's hard to show the mouse cursor here, but it, this is me mousing over the city hall, and uh, number 16, that is, I guess. If I mouse over number one, that's the entrance to the slums. So uh, you can see all this stuff, and I can use this to change between maps. So as we move around, um, like if we go to the slums, I'll be able to um, change the map to there and it will follow me around. So I won't need to use the A area map very often. We can use that to make sure we're synced up, um, but we'll actually have a, a nice uh, map on the side. I think that's gonna really make the game a bit more playable. Uh, there's a couple other things that it can do. One thing you may have noticed from the encamp screen, in future uh, versions of these gold box games, they've added a uh, fix button here, where while you're in camp somewhere safe, you can quick heal everybody up and I think it usually it's like your clerics cast heal and then rest and cast heal again but it's sort of automated so you don't have to memorize a spell cast it memorize it again rest cast it again and so on and so forth and seeing as at the early game all we're gonna have is cure light wounds which cures like one to six HP it can take forever a lot of micromanagey fiddly farty to do that uh, it's a little bit hard for me to show this bar but there's a there's a bar um can i just show this quick if i turn it on it's hard to explain without showing you guys but um yeah it doesn't want to display it but uh, you just have to trust me that there's a with this gold box companion program there is a little uh sidebar that i can't get to display for uh this video but it's got uh, a few things like in camp dash fix i click the button and it should heal everyone up to max now, I'm not going to try to abuse that by using it in, like, dangerous situations. I'll only use it in places we can rest and encamp normally. I'm not exactly 100% sure 
Um, it's, it's sort of like cheating. I think it just heals everyone to full automatically, perhaps. But uh, I think it's going to save me a lot of min-maxing time. It's got an option for storing memorized spells. What that means is, for someone... I don't even know if I have a mage here for sure. This is just a, a very quick test party. Um, if I memorize a bunch of spells and then and then click the the memorize button in my in my my software here it will re the, the program will remember what spells i've personally memorized so that after i cast them i can click restore spells and it will i believe automatically set up just like if you were selecting them out here like let's re remember a bunch of those for instance and uh it will automatically set this up again just like you know it, it saves me a bit of which spells did i cast uh, let's go through the list, try to figure it out. It lets me reset my spellbook a little bit easier, especially once we've got a lot of mages and stuff, and uh, more than just level 1 magic, basically. Uh, that's handy. Um, probably more handy is the character editor, which I believe I can show you. So if I click on one of the people... Okay, that looks that looks like the screen, right? Um, yeah, you can see my mouse. Okay, good. So this is the character editor for anyone in your party. Um, certainly you could cheat, which is not my plan at all. Or you could also, um, if you, if you feel like, uh, the, the, the female, I don't think I have a few, a female human fighter with me, but if you thought that the 18 slash 50 max for females was bull, uh, you could edit it here and have everyone that's a fighter, uh, I'd say a human fighter, uh, you could let female human fighters have 18 slash 00 so that they were as strong as men. It's this kind of thing you could do if you wanted. More importantly though, and this is actually what I'm planning on doing, because I was trying to find a way of using the classes I want, um, and one of my options was just use all humans, we talked about that earlier. One of my other options was I could just make a new party in the next game and completely toss these first six guys, um, because some of the rules change a little bit as, as you progress and you get... Uh, I think there's a couple new classes. I think Knight and Ranger unlock in the second game, for instance, and they're not in the first one. Uh, but one thing we can do is I can pick a multi-class like Elf or Half-Elf, for instance, or whatever. I can store their race so that the, this program remembers what they are. Once they hit the level limit, I can switch them to Human, which will let the game promote them to like level 7 Fighter, which they wouldn't be allowed to or whatever number it is. And then after they've been promoted, restore them back to elf. And then after that, the game doesn't even check and I can just keep. So it can let me remove the the racial level limits. And I think I'm going to do that because uh, as far as I understand, once we get to like D&D 2nd Edition, they don't have those silly limits anyway. It's only the first couple of games that should have had them. And uh, I think they're just going to mess us up in the long run. So like I said, it's a little bit cheaty. Um, but I think it's going to make the characterization a little bit a little bit smoother for me. I can actually pick whatever party I want and not have to worry about, you know, half-elves not getting max level of uh, fighter or cleric or whatever. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, there's lots of, lots of stuff you can look at here. I'm not going to be inventory editing or, or editing anything important like that. I, I'm basically going to use it just to bypass the level limit and uh, maybe... Depending on um, our luck, when you get a level up, um, you, you roll a dice based on your class as to how many HP you get, which is somewhere around here. Is there not an HP? Pretty sure it shows you. Your, yeah, hit points, sorry. Um, so one of the things you could do is, like, say you're a fighter and you're supposed to roll a D10 plus your constitution bonus. If you roll a 1 and, you're, and the game gives you plus 1 HP on level 2, um, I could edit that. I could sort of re-roll it a little bit in my head here. Maybe not give them the max bonus every time, but I can try to keep it a little bit fairer because you can seriously uh, gimp your, your characters if they just get really bad rolls on their levels up. And, um, you know, I, I might consider doing something like that. Anyway, point is, it's a really nifty little software, a bit of software, and um, depending on how cheaty you feel, you could overuse it, I'm sure. But uh, I think I'm going to be using it at least for the, the HUD, the, the HP display at the top, and the map on the left. And I'll probably use it for the racial um, level limit reduction. And I think it's... I'm really excited, actually. The fact that I've got a map on the side um, and a little bit more HP information for battles, I think this is really, really going to help out. So um, hopefully you guys are excited as well. I'm more excited now than I was last at 
last time I was recording, and uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks for watching, of course, and I'll see you guys for the series once we get there.